I don't, I don't, I'm not going to ask anybody if they like the new format because I, I'm, I'm so used to an hour and a half that paring it down to an hour has been a real experience for me. You know, I mean, it was like, so you remember in Bible college, we never had anything less than 50 minutes, did we? I mean, it did. So anyway, let's get started. If you got your Bibles, you can turn to uh, Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have your Bible, I guess you can maybe read some of it off the uh, screen up there. All right. So this is a... Uh, it's one thing to know that you have a responsibility as a Christian. God left you here so that you can be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Uh, but God's been, he knows us very well. And so he's given us some good instructions on how in the world we can do this. Because this is tough. I, I see in my own life, a little confession time here, uh, that the world, way the world is changing right now, uh, it bothers me greatly. And, um, and it's, it's hard not to let my attitude get, um, how shall I describe it, stinky. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so it, it's, it's easy for us to, uh, to become negative because we live in such... Uh, a negative world, and to see some of the insanity. I mean, this, if you know some of the truth and you're grounded in, in the knowledge of God and his creative acts and his plan for the world and his love for us, you're grounded in those things, and then you start seeing people, why are they being so stupid? <laughs> well, it's not, I hate, to say this, it might be seem like it's risen to a new level in our culture in our time, but it's nothing new, okay? And and we sometimes get really upset with people because they they don't seem to know any history. I mean, history is so important that we understand this. You know, we we've, we've talked about this many times. You say, well, let's socialism is, is good. Oh, but no, socialism is unbiblical, and every time it's been put into practice, every time it's been a disaster. And the only way, I mean, this is, let's get this out of the way so we can go on to something more positive. The, the only way that socialism has been adapted in a country is through violence. And, and in our last century, the amount of people who died so that socialism could be implemented is in the hundreds of millions of people. And that fact should scare anybody away from it. Okay, but some people are running headlong and some people act like they don't know anything. It's just as wrong for us to be ignorant of history too. And sometimes we, we, we demonstrate that ignorance. But we live in a world that, that you know, uh, I was thinking about this, talking to someone today about uh, the first century. You know, we talk here in America how tough it is to be a Christian more and more. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's so easy to be a Christian in America. It really is. It is so easy to, to name the name of Christ, to identify as a Christian. I mean, there are people in the world today that all they have to do is stand on the corner and say, I love Jesus, and they're off to prison, and they've lost everything. Their family never sees them again. That's not going to happen to you yet. <laughs> yet. But in the first century, was it easier to be a Christian? I, they, I don't think so. I don't think so. But, uh, but we need to pray. God said, pray for those who are in authority. All right? We need to do that. So what do we do? Well, we can't fix this world politically, can we? You know, if we could just elect the right people. How, how long have we been thinking that? You know, and it hasn't worked yet, has it? It's been better under some and worse under others. There's no doubt about that. But you can't fix it because it's a sin problem. It's a heart problem. And that's why God's left you here. That's why you, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, 
are still on this earth. And so how do we navigate this? Well, here I think Colossians 3 gives us a real road map on how God expects us to, to keep our sanity in a crazy world. Okay, Chapter 3 and uh, verse 1. It says, if then, and uh, I, I don't use the NIV, but they start off with the word since, and that's a good understanding for the believer. And so you can, you can examine your own heart. Have, were you raised with Christ? This is something that, that we should be certain about. Jesus died for me. He paid my sin debt. He rose again from the dead, and that means that the Father saw the suffering of his soul. He was satisfied. There is no more offering for sin. And when I believed, the Holy Spirit placed me into Christ and identified me completely with Jesus Christ in the eyes of God. And I am forgiven of my sins and clothed in the righteousness of Christ I am safe forever in Jesus. I, that is since. Since I was raised with Christ. If you're here and you haven't trusted Christ, friend, you need to do that. You need to move from if to since. That it is your possession as a child of God. And uh, it's the greatest thing in the world. And you should never leave here without saying no to my efforts to save myself. And yes to Christ's work on the cross for me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So if, or since, Christian, you were raised with Christ, this is what you need to do. You need to watch more news. You, you, need, to, you need to turn that TV on and you need to watch news all day long. And that will just give you this wonderful peace in your heart. It will confuse you. It will irritate you. It will aggravate you. It will make you crazy. All right, so we don't want to be ignorant about it, but I mean, enough is enough, right? Enough is enough. And uh, last week we talked about the times in which we live and how strong the lie is. The lie is so powerful. And uh, the spirit of deception, you know, it's just, uh, I hate it that you just can't listen to anything or watch anything and just receive it. You got to filter everything today. You got to be so careful. And sometimes it's just hard to know. We have to be humble and seek God, don't we? So, no, we don't watch the news. That's not where we get peace. That's not what God calls us to do. If you're a Christian, you've been raised with Christ, He says, seek those things which are above. You know, uh, you've heard this before. Uh, somebody. Ask another fellow how he was doing. He says, well, under the circumstances. Now, if that fellow was a Christian, you would go, well, what in the world are you doing down there? What are you doing under the circumstances? We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I mean, you start reading about what, who we are in Christ and what God's done for us. We've been raised together with him. That's who we are. That's our identity in Christ. And so, if that's who I am and that's what God's done for me, then I don't need to grovel around in this world. He said, lift up your eyes. Seek those things which are above where Christ is. Now, we, we uh, there, there's a... a a doctrine about God, a characteristic of God we called omnipresent. And uh, that's very comforting, isn't it? God is everywhere. Where, where can I flee from your presence, the psalmist cried out. There's no place. He named it high, low, left, right. God's there. For the believer, he is always with us. Jesus made this promise, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now, uh, I have a, we have an old dog, other than myself, at our house. And this old dog, he's, he's an old beagle. He's 15 years old. He just had his birthday a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Buddy is blind as a bat. He can't see. He barely can hear. 
It's usually when you drop a plate or something that he goes, oh, I heard something, you know? And, uh, and so the poor dog bumps around and he can find his way outside and back inside. He still eats like a horse, you know? He's, uh, but you can walk up to him and he's lying there all peacefully and you just want to pet him. You know what he does? Jumps. He didn't know. We were there all the time. He wasn't aware of us. You know, sometimes God comes along and he pats you on the back, doesn't he? And you, you jump. We need to be aware he's with us all the time. But Christ is pictured in Scripture. His location is at the right hand of God. All right. Revelation tells us that there is a throne in heaven and as the book closes, it calls it the throne of God and the Lamb. Now, it doesn't say the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. It says the throne. And they share this authority in the Godhead. And, uh, and so Christ is pictured there at the right hand of God, a position of, of honor and power to intercede for you and for me. He is our advocate there. And, and so, my goodness, we are in such a wonderful place. And so we need to seek those things. You know, Jesus talked about this. Where, your heart's where your treasure is. So if our treasure's on this earth, that's where our heart is. And it's going to be broken, isn't it? But if our treasure's in heaven, our heart's in heaven, what we love and care about. And there's... You know, it's not about things, it's about a person. It's about a person, and this is really what we need to, to gather from this. How am I going to navigate this world as a faithful Christian? Well, Paul warns Timothy in, in 2 Timothy 2 about some things that would entrap him and make his, his faithfulness ineffective. And uh, he uses the the idea of a soldier and how a soldier needs to be faithful to his, his leadership and not be entangled with the other things of this world. And so there's this, this picture here of this relationship. How can I be a faithful ambassador in this world? Well, it begins with my focus. It begins with my awareness of, of Christ in my life and my loyalty to him. Set your mind on things above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Now, we, we say, here we are in this world, in this world so bad, isn't it? You know, we see it more and more. Uh, there's, there's, again, you know, I can't say my life is bad. My life is really, really good. It's much better than I deserve. And probably all of us in this room Except Steve can say that. And <laughs> Steve would even say that, I'm sure. And, uh, but we need to uh, embrace what God has for us above all these things. It's not so bad here, but it's better. What we have is far better, and we need to put our priorities in order. And so this begins as, as Jesus was talking to the Jewish people. He took their mind, he tried to take their, their eyes from the physical and the outward and put it on the spiritual and on the inward. He tried to move them, you know, your priorities. Move it from the temporal to the eternal. This is what God's trying to do. Get us to change our perspective on this thing. And so as being raised with Christ, given new life in Jesus Christ, and given a mission on this earth, we have God with us, and he's got a new set of priorities for us. And we say, well, we're going into a rough world here, aren't we? But greater is he who's in you than he who is in the world. God is greater than all. And so set your mind on things above. This is a choice that we make. It's a choice. Where is your focus? Where is your attention? We well, say, well, if you've got a, if you've got a three-year-old in the house, you don't have much choice, do you? Okay, there, there. Uh, I, 
I don't know how you ladies do it. Mom, 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 you know. One, I don't know how you put up with that. I don't know how you ignore it so long. I just don't know how you. But anyway, uh, there are things that, that yell for our attention. But God says, you make a choice where your attention is. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Look in, uh, hold your place here and, and turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want you to see what this looks like in the life of somebody who has practiced setting their mind on things above. Happens to be the same human being God used to write Colossians in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And, he, and he's, he's been talking about this life. Uh, look at verse 7. We have this treasure, the gospel of Jesus Christ, in, in earthen vessels and clay pots, crack pots for most of us, and uh, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And so God's chosen the weak things, the base thing, the foolish things, so that we don't glory in people, we glory in the Lord. You don't get a lot of credit. God will give you credit. All right. And he's a righteous judge, but don't look for credit. Let God give you credit. And, uh, but on this side of heaven, all the credit needs to go to Christ. We, it's so easy to be a Christian, verse 8 says. We are hard-pressed on every side. Isn't, you ever feel that way? Paul said, this is the reality of my life, yet not crushed, okay? <laughs> yet not crushed. We are perplexed. There, we, we, you've been there, haven't you? But we are not in despair. We are, are, uh, are persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We are struck down. But we're not destroyed. We always carry about the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. As we are attacked, as we go through trials and tribulations, that's the opportunity for the victory in Christ to shine through us. And so God's not saying that it, if you take this job, which you and you trust Christ as Savior, he gives it to you, and if you accept it, to be an ambassador for Christ, it doesn't mean that, okay, I'm going to live in a mansion here on earth and I'm going to have servants and security guards and everything's going to be fine, okay? No, Jesus was persecuted. His followers were persecuted. There's no promise of health and wealth and blessings and, and safety on this earth physically. But spiritually, God says that we have the greatest protection in all the world. We have God himself. And that's really what endures. And so, let's skip a few verses here and go to uh, verse 16. All right, so we, we've got it hard, but God's carrying us through. And so, verse 16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, and you young people don't have a clue, but, uh, you know, wait till you get to be 65, and then you know, uh, the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, this is the emphasis that God wants us to have. Okay, now, this is, this does not say ignore the outward man. It doesn't say that, does it? All right, when Paul's writing to Timothy, he says bodily exercise profits a little bit. But he says godliness, that's something that really, really profits. Okay, so it's a matter of comparison there. Don't, don't, don't live off diet soda. It will kill you, okay? You, you need to eat healthy and be active and, uh, and ride a motorcycle. It'll just make your life better. And so... Uh, <laughs> Or, or, or fly a, a, a plane. There you go. So anyway, uh, it is perishing, but the inward man, the you that lives forever, is being renewed day by day. 
Now, you can't do that. God can do that. But God wants you to cooperate with him in that. And so God is in the business of transforming our lives. And uh, so we can transform our lives ourselves. We can do it in some productive ways, can't we? We can learn new skills. We can, we can educate ourselves. We can um, get involved in some programs that discipline our lives. We can, we can you know, self-help actually is not a bad thing, is it? Okay, there's things you can do. But there's limits to that. And God's plan for you are, it's way up above anything we could do that way. You see, God predetermined that you who have trusted Christ will be conformed to the image of his son. You're going to be demonstrably like Jesus. That's a big step, isn't it? That's not something you can do. It's something God. And God doesn't want to wait till you get to heaven to do all that. He wants to be working on that now. And that's, that's why he lets things in our lives. But when we embrace him and get to know him and walk with him, it's a process that God is accomplishing in our life. Our inward man is being renewed, made new day by day. It's interesting how God uses that idea over. You know, there are certain things in our our position and our relationship with God that way vertically that are settled and done. Okay, I am righteous in Christ and I'm his child and all those things are done. But in my earthly experience, there's things that are being worked out day by day. Uh, it's like the children of Israel, they could, you know, in the wilderness, they could just go out in the morning and gather up some manna and they had food for the day. Uh, but if it weren't Friday, they couldn't get two days' worth. They had to do it day by day. And God is in the business of, of, of not showing us 20 years down the road in our lives. The Bible says that his word is a lamp to, to our feet. It shows us where to stand and it's a light into our path. But it doesn't shine way down the path, else we wouldn't have to walk by faith, would we? So God gives us enough, but we walk by faith. And uh, day by day, he's renewing us. For Paul, who says, our light affliction, <laughs> and I think that's a joke, isn't it? Is he being sarcastic? Is that allowed in the Bible? The Holy Spirit, does he use his sarcasm? You, you, you go to chapter 11 here and you read, oh my goodness, Paul, how could you even be talking after all that suffering you went through? And he calls it a light affliction. Okay? And so I had a bad day yesterday. I went fishing and I got so seasick I couldn't stand it. And, uh, and so I felt pretty bad about myself. But if I'd call Steve up and he starts talking to me, I feel great. Okay? All right? That's, he's like God's angel here to to lift you up, say, well, my life is pretty easy. And uh, thank you, Steve. So anyway, uh, it's a light affliction. And it's but for a moment. It seems like, <laughs> it seems like it's going so slow. Uh, it seems like it's, it'll never come to pass. But it does. And in eternity is forever. It's forever. My goodness. It works, our light affliction works for us, a, more, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen. You see, we finally got to the point, didn't we? <laughs> we don't look at the things which are seen. That doesn't mean you ignore stuff that's around you. I would hate to have this be in the driving manual, you know? Got these people come in and learn how to drive. And this is one of the instructions. While we do not look at the things which are seen. Please. That's why we have an eye test, right? Because <laughs> you, need, you need to look at the things which are seen in an earthly perspective. But for your life, to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, to walk with God, you have to look beyond these things. For us to rise above the circumstances of this life, we have to look beyond this. 
The Bible says we have a blessed hope. Jesus, Jesus provides that. He is. He's coming back. Paul said, if our hope was only in this world, as a Christian, we are of all men most miserable. He's talking about rejecting the things of this world and then having nothing beyond it. But we have everything beyond it. And so this, this light affliction is working for us. And, and, it, and, and it, how does it do that? Well, we don't focus on the things which are seen, but we let God show us the things which are not seen, and those are our things in Christ. You know, you can go to chapter 1 of Ephesians, and you can read how we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are blessed. You know, we try to train ourselves with the right kind of language, don't we? Use the right words. And, and we're so used to saying, well, I'm really fortunate. No, that's not the right one. Oh, I'm so lucky. No, that's not it, you know. Uh, I am blessed. That's the Christian word. Because it gives God the glory. It shows God is the source. I am blessed. The things which are seen are temporary. You know, now, in... in that feels good when we look at the things that are bad, okay? Uh, the, I'm strapped financially. God says that's temporary. I am sick. God says that's temporary. Uh, I have to go to work at this place with these people. That is temporary. Whatever is bad in your life, if you, this is kind of helpful to know it's only temporary, isn't it? But there are things that we love and like in this world, and they're a pleasure to us. They are also temporary. And so that's healthy for us to understand that we can't count on these things. We can't say that we have them forever. Because what can we have forever? Our relationship with God in Christ. And so you have to put Jesus, for you to be healthy, for you to be victorious, you need to put Christ above the dearest thing on this earth to you. Because there's no thing on this earth, no person on this earth, nothing that you cannot lose or will not lose in time. But you'll never lose Jesus. Your relationship with him cannot be broken. And so, why do we do this? Because it started off in verse 1, we were raised with Christ. Something had to precede that, didn't it? And so here we come around and, and uh, it says, you died. Now, this isn't easy, but it's something that is very important in, in the Christian life. And if you take some time and, and go to Romans chapter 6 and do a little study there, you'll understand that... that uh, God instructs us in order to be victorious, to walk in the Spirit, we have to reckon some things dead. Now, this passage is going to get us down there, put to death, it says. But um, death is something that we see in a very physical way in our lives, but God uses that to teach us about some very important spiritual truths. For us to be victorious, for us to be new, for us to have the newness of life, we have to die to the old one. And Christ did that for you. When he died on the cross, it was for you. It was in your stead. He didn't deserve to die, but you do. I do. We are sinners. Jesus died for us. Now, there's some things that happen. Turn to Galatians chapter 6, this idea of death. And Paul is using it here in uh, talking about the cross. Galatians chapter 6. Please turn, Paige. Thank you. All right, so 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians. If you got to Ephesians, you went too far. And so, Paul giving some... Uh, some testimony here and he talks about the cross 
In verse 14, God forbid that I should boast. Lord, I don't want to brag, except I want to brag about the cross. I want to brag about a God who loved me enough to send his son from heaven to earth. Jesus humbled himself and stepped off the most glorious, most powerful place in the universe, and he came down here so that he could die in your place, in my place. He couldn't die on that throne up there as the eternal son, but as the only begotten of the Father, he could die for you and for me. And so that's what Paul says we need to boast about. You know, you know how special I am? You know how valuable I am? God paid for me with the life of his son. Now, God got a raw deal. I know that. It's, it's, he paid way too much. But that's his love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him for you and for me. And so Paul says, I'm not going to brag about myself. I'm not going to brag about my accomplishments. I got something really important to brag about. I'm going to brag about the cross of Jesus Christ. And that, that death, that cross, has accomplished some very important things. And it gives me freedom to be a faithful Christian in this life. People say, well, the cross is the beginning of Christian life. Yes, it is. But you, it's, it's the strength of the Christian life. It's the basis of the Christian life. There's no victory without the cross. And the cross is every moment, every day, I need the cross of Jesus Christ and what was accomplished there. What was accomplished? It says, by whom, the person of Jesus Christ on the cross, the world has been crucified to me. Now, crucifixion is not like, go to your room or sit in the corner. I sentence you to six months. It's not even, I sentence you to life. The cross is death. It's horrible death. It's death. And so, Jesus was crucified, and he says, when the Jesus was crucified, the world was crucified to me. It's dead to me, Paul says. It doesn't have this power over me. Death. Separation. I'm not going to... Now, when somebody dies, you know, we remember them. Maybe we have a grave site and we go put flowers on the grave from time to time, okay? But that person is gone, isn't it? Okay, that person no longer has demands on your life or tells you what to do or anything. Paul says, the world is crucified to me. They make no demands on my life. They do not tell me what to do. My life is not prior prioritized when you got... A, a loved one in your life that's a priority isn't it you've got responsibilities to love them means to care for them the world has been crucified to me paul says i don't i don't have to care for it and he says but i've been crucified to the world and you know the world's going to start treating us more and more like we're dead and you know what you do with dead things you put them away you bury them if Jesus doesn't come back, that's what happens. But Jesus is coming back. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. It's not if Christ, who is our life, appears, it's when. And the uh, old Bible teacher on the radio and TV used to say, perhaps today. Perhaps today. And that's the truth. I hope you're ready to see him. Let's pray. Father, we are uh, we're overwhelmed sometimes by how to stay on course in this world, how to uh, keep our attitudes right, how to show that we belong to you in Christ. And 
Lord, sometimes our attitudes and our actions don't reflect that we are children of God. Lord, help us to learn from this passage about how to get that straightened out. Um, to not focus on this world, but to focus on the eternal world in Jesus Christ. Father, to see things from your perspective, to set our minds on things above. Oh, Lord, please give us your grace and victory to put our focus where it belongs on the things that are not temporal but eternal, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.